I am your host, Shane Hazen. Coming up on today's episode, this one's a special one. We talk the great Radiohead documentary, Meeting People is Easy, with its director, Grant Chi. Uh, But first up, what I watched this week. Um, On HBO Max, they've premiered the new Steven Soderbergh movie, Let Them All Talk, which he shot, uh, I guess, last year. And it's one of his largely improvised movies, but uh, part of his trilogy that include movies like Bubble and The Girlfriend Experience. But instead of... Unlike those movies they he got, which were largely non act or um, non professional actors, he got people like Meryl Streep and Candace Bergen and Diane Weiss to be in this, um, and Lucas Hedges, and so there's not a lot of tap dancing narratively going on. The this the movie plays out pretty straight, and what's more f- interesting is, even though it was improvised, the story and key parts of the dialogue were written by the short story writer Deborah S. Eisenberg, who I'm largely unfamiliar with, but it gives this movie a very loose feel, and it builds towards its ending, which is a pretty moving ending. It's uh, it's getting good reviews. Uh, but the more notable thing I watched this week was Francis Ford Coppola's, or, okay, not officially titled, Francis Ford Coppola's on title, Mario Puzo's The Godfather Coda, The Death of Michael Corleone, which more people are making a big deal about how much of a mouthful that title is. But for the, for those, everyone who likes to shit on Godfather 3, which to be fair, yeah, it's just, it's not the first two movies. If you want to see one of the, hear one of the best critiques of the movie, all you need to listen to is the commentary track on Godfather 3. And Coppola talks about all the sacrifices he made with, you know, the Winona Ryder not taking the role and his daughter, Sofia Coppola taking the uh, eventual role of the Corleone daughter, Robert Duvall not coming in for uh, the extra money, them having to write him out for George Hamilton, who holds his own. Come on, let's give him credit. And uh, most notably, he's been saying this for years. I don't know if he said it beforehand. I've never seen it. Or if it just was after the bad review started coming in for Godfather 3. But... This movie was not supposed to be a third part. It was also supposed to be an encapsulation, an epilogue, or, in his musical terms, a coda, and he always said the death of Michael Corleone. So in his his recent spate of re-edits on his movie, this movie doesn't come down significantly, but there's some reshuffling. And, I mean, I don't know what to say. When I watched it, it still felt like the same movie, but... A lot of what people find silly about Godfather 3, I don't find. Um, I think its flaws are... Look, when you look at the first two Godfather movies, great films work just because details are played out with confidence. And in this recut, they put a, a Michael uh, scene at the front to get his plot in early. And the scene plays out very much now in mirroring Godfather 1 and the I Believe in America scene that opens that up. And that movie famously opens with a single shot slowly zooming out. And this one is just this bizarre cut back and forth, Godfather 3. So the movie just is is filled with all the same details, but it's so ambitious and you've got to get everything right. And that's why... A movie like Godfather 1 and 2 are considered jewels. Like, because people putting that much into a movie normally don't nail everything like those first two movies did. And give Coppola credit, because one of the things about Godfather 3 that's always never seemed silly to me and always worked is the idea of ending the entire saga operatically. And for what it's worth, God, the the oddest thing to me, whenever I always try to explain to people what an editor does, why they work for s- three months to two years on editing a movie, and usually what it ends up being is you watch d- 
different versions of the same thing over and over and over, and eventually it starts becoming preferences. Uh, I had a friend who ta- who was teaching editing class, and we all and when he was trying to figure out ways to do this, we ended up suggesting alternate cuts of movies. So you want to say, watch the different Blade Runner cuts. Watch how they changed the studio tried to change the ending of Brazil. And this is another example of it's, it's a great example because it's clearly an improvement. But sometimes when you're watching different cuts, multiple cuts of, uh, of the same movie, there's a feeling, there's a lot of tricks you can do. You cut around performances, which in this movie, there's, there's a lot of cutting around uh, Sofia Coppola, which to, to, to the game. I mean, there's this favorite, famous no dead reaction that is no longer in the movie and is not missed. But there's also, to clarify stuff, you cut scenes short. And the, every one of these scenes ends with this, like, pre in Godfather Coda, ends with these, like, premature fade out. It works. It's a better movie. I'm not going to deny that. And I think across the board, everyone seems to agree that it's a better movie. But there is a feeling of whenever you get to that point that you're cutting your losses, like you're not letting a movie play out to what the original intention was, which, I mean, you have to do. You have to fix. Your original intentions weren't reality, and now this is reality, and that's what editors do. And ultimately, it is still a better movie, so I wish we could have all seen it in a theater, but that's my usual refrain, so I hope you check it out. I wanted to follow up with a reading based off something from a few episodes back, the Jack Kirby Star Wars episode where Joseph Campbell came up. And I railed a little against Joseph Campbell. Um, I'm currently reading Jaron Lanier's biography, Dawn of the New Everything. And Lanier is, um, he could, he's called the father of virtual reality, but he kind of rails against that designation. Um, but in his book, he, t- he tells a story of when he first got out to Silicon Valley and he was uh, getting his first big jobs. One of the first ones he went for was at Lucasfilm as a video game programmer. Now, Lanier is a guy who thinks that, very forward-thinking, that the human race is only going to survive if we somehow create excellent art, which is where a lot of his VR comes from. And he also, in this book, is, I, which I'm barely into but really loving, he talks a lot about experimental film in terms of this. And so he, to, to lay out the story, he's getting interviewed by someone from Lucasfilm who would much rather be working in film. And the guy is very skeptical against him. And and he tells this guy a story of actually having uh, performed on the same bill as Joseph Campbell back in the day. And then he gets out of his opinion. And so the name Joseph Campbell comes up and he, he then comes up with this theory in this conversation, which I'll read here. Um, has a Joseph Campbell has a theory I don't really like all that much that all human stories are variations on the same shared story kind of like how Noam Chomsky says that there's a core language um, it's so confining I mean this idea about stories what if we don't really understand the stories of other cultures who are we to say that they're telling the same story we are and if there's only one story how can we have hope that stories will get better in the future if we believe there's only one story, maybe we're trapping ourselves in a small loop, like we're in a primitive, crappy computer program. And then the guy arguing against him starts bringing up how Star Wars is about the future, and the future's cool, and it's robot, faster than light spaceships, and how great the future would be. And Linnea replies, but the people are the same. They're stuck in the stup- uh, they're stuck in the st- in stupid, petty power games. They're cruel and selfish. Even the good guys are clannish and macho. Who needs more royal families? America was all about getting rid of them. And then he says, science fiction can be about people getting better, not just gadgets getting better. I mean, in 2001, Space Odyssey, there's this sense of transcendence, like we might outgrow our petty little conflicts. Okay, well, that's, and he says that's p- uh, pretty abstract and amoral. And he goes, what about Star Trek? Gene Roddenberry had this idea that people would get kinder as the machines got better. That's so much more exciting. I think it's actually happening in human history already. Documentary and music video 
with director Grant Cheese on today's episode, and we are talking Radiohead's Meeting People is Easy, the feature doc which he directed. And for those of you who know that we're doing an episode where I get to talk Radiohead, uh, you know how much this means to me. Radiohead was my North Star for so long, and especially OK Computer and the era of B-sides that came from this. And this movie, Meeting People is Easy, is just such an amazing extension of the greatness of that album and it's it's also kind of amazing just because it uses all these music video techniques which we talk about in the episode and yet it takes it to feature length and there's just so much lyricism but like the digital analog argument that that album really played up comes out in this documentary and we talk also a lot about how the movie's been portrayed as just this alienation with Radiohead have with their audience. And I think, again, we talk about this episode, it, that misses the point of why it's so great about the, the, the doc. There, there's so many formative touches, uh, cinematically and editorially and stylistically. Some of them really, that are a big deal to me, some of them do come from what was popular or fashionable in music video at the time, but Grant G manages to sustain that because, you know, music videos tended to like lose their interest after three minutes. And this is a 90 minute doc or 88 minute doc. Um, so I asked him one of the techniques I, re I, I was always fascinated with and wanted to talk to him about is the, uh, he, there's a lot of impositions and double exposures. There's a lot of two images playing off each other, which anyone that knows music videos from the nineties thinks is familiar, but there's something really intriguing and innovative. A lot of it's basics of like digital analog on the images fighting against each other or color and black and white fighting against each other. But I've always found it so invigorating. Well, he passed along that he uh, didn't finish his answer on this and wrote an email. Uh, While well, I do indeed have a bad stylistic habit of assembling pretty multi-layer sequences digitally with an eye on composition, precise form of the blend, etc., the ones in Meaning People's Easy were all done in camera. Running 100 foot roll of film through a Bolex, winding it back, running it through again, etc. So all totally random, well-guided random. Uh, I wanted to pass along that email follow-up that we didn't get down to the episode, but I hope you all enjoy this. It was a, a pleasure to be able to talk with Grant G. I'm I'm actually coming from uh, Indiana. I was looking up your background. Uh, I thought I saw that you did some. Uh, you 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 did some college at the University of Illinois. I did. Yes, I spent a year in Urbana. Yeah, I'm four hours south of there. Yeah, that's where we're. That's where we're coming from. Um, what is so? What is your uh, film background? And it's you said you didn't go to film school online. No, no, but my my film background is really just learned on the job i got i got a uh, sort of stumbled into production jobs in london when i was in my mid-20s just because it was a fun thing to do at the time i didn't know anything about anything really um but it was a really good school if, um, it was a production called buzz which is a very odd kind of experimental mtv show which was run by a couple of very interesting guys a director called mark pellington and a chap called john klein and um, it was a really Mark, anarchic. Mark Pellington. Yeah, so it was a very sort of culturally anarchic, anarchic in all kinds of ways, um, TV show that was mixing kind of countercultural stuff, pop music stuff, celebrity interviews, ideas about sampling, about postmodernism, all of it in this weird kind of druggy mix. Um, okay. And that's where I learned pretty much everything, really, from from playing on this TV show. So, is music video the main area where you were learning from? Uh, that's a really interesting thing. Not as a direct input, like I was learning from music video, but the the, the culture that I was in, music video was the most happening, free form way of doing creativity on a budget um 
Fair enough. You know, uh, 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 sort of feature films never came near to this stuff. TV was a really straight world thing that nobody much bothered with traditional TV. Um, yeah. People were doing commercials, music videos, and experimental little things. And, uh, well, the trick of uh, it seems like uh, that I feel like meeting people is easy does that it's really hard is to sustain the stylization of a music video and the excitement of that stylization okay. to a feature link, okay. which the movie does. So it's I, well, okay. What is your, uh, what films were you growing up on? What films? Movie-wise? Yeah. What um, were you watching as a kid? Oh man. War films. War films. Yeah. It was big in Britain in the, you know, I'm old. So in the sixties, early seventies, we were watching, you know, you got a lot of films about world war two. Okay. And bad British comedies, bad uh, adaptations of British comedies to the big screen, which were just awful. Um, like, like what? Oh God Almighty! I did watch the Dick. I mean, this won't mean anything to anyone. The Dick Emery movie that was quite big. The On the Buses movie, things like that. And then um, I didn't really do anything that. Uh, engage with film culture at all until I was quite old, you know, college age, and then going to see things like Stranger Than Paradise, you know, and okay. Vin Vendor's stuff. The, okay, these are these are clicking in, these are making sense. So what, um, how did you, were you directing music videos whenever uh, the, the uh, this project came up? Well, and how it was easy. Um, I had just started, I think, a couple of years before, and I kind of, something had clicked. It had taken me quite a long time of just dicking around with cameras and on the margins of things. And something clicked um, personally and creatively around about 1995, 96. I did a couple of projects, which were very short, one, sh- one music video and one short film, which was kind of an extended music video, which got a bit of attention. Um, the second one was for a, a, a call them a dance band, somewhere between art band and dance band called Spooky. I, I did okay. a short film for them called Fort Fan Sound, which got a bit of attention. And luckily for me, uh, Tom York was a fan of this artist, this outfit, and had seen the stuff. And so when they were looking, when Radiohead were looking for people to work on uh, music from OK Computer. I was kind of in the mix. Okay. Were they thinking of a long form project or just having a, someone to film them on tour? N- well, no, not at all. Um, uh, you know, I can remember this stuff because it was such a big deal being called into the meeting and somebody saying it's about the Radiohead project. It's about the radio. yeah. And um, basically when, before OK Computer came out, I got, got called in to parlor phone and handed the cassette of OK Computer and like, you know, you will be killed if this gets out into the world, but here it is. This is before release, obviously. Yeah, yeah, there right. was maybe six months or four months or something, something like that. Cool. A cassette. And they said, we wanted, the idea is we want to do a music video for every track on the album and release this video thing. Okay. And they said, we've already commissioned one, the first, the lead single is going to be Paranoid Android. We've got this brilliant am- animation. Second one, Jonathan Glaze is do- doing for Karma Police. And then we're going to just work our way through the album and do every track. And, okay. um, and I don't know how, and maybe I make this up, but um, I've got a f- feeling that they had a half a million pounds set aside to produce this video album. And okay. those first two videos ate up three hundred thousand pounds of that. Okay, I mean, um, well, it's funny because so, it's, so many bands seem to have this idea to have a visual accompaniment album, especially when music videos were still popular. And then, like, it seems like things like money and reality or life get in the way and they, they this happens yeah three there's only two yeah. three albums or three videos out of it yeah i mean that, that wasn't that wasn't out of the question you know i, I know that animation the first one for the paranoid android you know animations just take forever and so if somebody doesn't finish 
that you want them to finish. So you've got to pay them for another eight months to do the other two minutes of the track. Um, but those are the sort of budgets you could have you could have spent on big music videos back then. But the fact that they wanted to do ten, nobody quite thought that through. So there was, as I, I understood it, there was two hundred grand left in the in the pot and no film to show for it. So then I think there was a plan B idea of do something that could be done for 200 grand that still felt like a film. And I got commissioned just to kind of start documenting what was going on with the band. I, you know, three days is what I was hired for at first. And it just kind of rolled from there. When was this? I mean, or what time frame? Oh, um, it's, it's, it's hard to remember. It's a long time ago, but it feels like, whether this is true or not, it feels like maybe a couple of weeks before they did the album launch, which was in Barcelona. Um, okay. For some reason. The documentary has the dates at the time. Okay. <laughs> I haven't watched it for a long time, so the date would be there. So it's April 90, May 97, let's say something like that. I got the tour starting as like May 16th, oh, the first yeah. date on the movie is, is May 22nd okay. in Barcelona at the tail end of that as the first show that you've documented. Oh, so, okay. but you, you came in on tour and you're following them on tour. Well, this wasn't anything beforehand. This, this, it wasn't a tour. It, it, the tour doesn't, hadn't started then. This was a launch event. Okay. So this is, they had two evenings at a medium sized venue in Barcelona and they flew in. Yeah. I'm going to say hundreds of journalists, but it's probably a couple of dozen journalists from around the world. Put them in a hotel. Here's the album. Okay. So when you're filming, were you just kind of, um, were you just trying to get, uh, get footage for the cut? Were you, um, did you have a specific idea? I mean, it's only three days of filming. Yeah. Like you, you, and, and, was this the idea this is going to be another potential for the video with the rest of the budget that's left or no I have no no idea of product um and i think that's okay. that's to the credit of the the commissioner a woman called dilly gent who's who commissioned all their work for years and years and years i think it was just go out there document see what happens and i had some very nebulous ideas about I think all I wanted to do was uh, not document them in the stereotypical way so I, 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 I seem to remember that it was like okay shoot it on Super 8 don't do any sync sound make it kind of lyrical and poetical and somehow you know but but as vague as that um, yeah well how many different formats did you shoot on because I mean like one of the things that uh, that I find amazing about the movie is how it, it is of the album where it's this mixed media. Mm -hmm. And there's not a, a watching it last night. I remember more digital than there really was in the movie, but it feels like you're trying to br bridge analog and digital yeah. or starting the process on that. The, well, you're, yes, you're right. And I can't remember whether my thoughts about that came after to having done it or whether they were um, part of it. But I remember at okay. some point, either long after I'd actually done the work or maybe while I was doing it, thinking that there was some correspondence between film as guitars and digital video as sampling and Pro Tools and the, the album was those two things coming together and so the films. But I think I might just be making up that. It was a music video in the mid '90s. Are you are you working to try to go through their voice? Are you trying to just come up with something that they like? Are you, because because the thing is, it, this 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 movie has such a distinct style that really stands out. Like it, it really, for, as an editor standpoint, it, it was. I saw this as a teenager and blew my mind editorially. Okay, well that's. I'll tell Jerry the editor about that. Um, that's uh, uh Jerry, Chater. Jerry Chater. Yeah. Okay. You, I feel so bad because I've seen this movie so many times. And last night was the first time I actually looked through the credits and saw how many different things he was credited as. Yeah. He did additional music. Yep. Yeah, he did. We, I mean, you'll like this as an editor. We, we generated or he generated a lot of kind of atmospheres. And again, taking this, um, 
the film being an analog or to the music somehow, he plugged in uh, audio pedals into the edits so sweet. So we would take you can hear it. Yeah, That's so cool. So we've got oh wow, you know, high eight tapes of something or other, and he's stamping on audio pedals, recording the output, feeding that back and stuff like that. The there's well because it, it starts on early where um, one of the first shows you have Tom York doing his uh, vocal warm ups and yeah. then you start overlapping them and it starts to turn into this wall of sound that just starts sounding very chaotic and you guys you guys get into this soundscape of a band that had just come out with an album that was a pretty definitive headphone rock album that was like a that had a lot of sophisticated noise into it and you guys are matching it in, in the editing suite. Well, it's amazing because um, I can't overstate how technically incompetent I was. I mean, that that stuff, that scene you were just talk, talking about, no, seriously, I mean, I, knew, I had a that recorder that I didn't know how to use and a Super 8 camera number. I mean, literally in the in the dressing room, wobbling a DAT rec recorder around. And then we go back and I've got this junk and I spent months throwing away 99% of what I had. And then there's a few little bits that are usable. And then we got jiggy with the few little bits. Well, the rawness, it, 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 it comes to, so how much did you do? You, you were saying you, your, your shoot ratio, you would have shot like thrown away 99%. Like yeah. How much were you shooting on this? Just, just shooting whenever you could. I mean, I, in my head, I got a figure of 200 hours or something like that. I mean, it's not, it's not massive in these days when you can just roll for five hours at a time. Yeah. It's a lot, it's a lot to watch. For, yeah, half the job. But so back to the formats. What did you shoot on? It was Super A. Did you get to a Bolex? At yeah, the yeah. Lots, so most of the color stuff is either a Bolex or an equivalent. Another another thing I was using, Canon Scopic. Okay. Yeah. What were you? How were you thinking of color? Because I mean, there's so much distinct color temperature on the film. Um, and, and what's cool is how you're mixing it too, which it, it just. It's all ignorance and touchy feely. So anything that anything you saw on video, we 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 just took all the color out because I oh, was okay. such a snob. I thought there's you can't use color video, and then with co that? color grading, I think we just did one telecine pass and probably got stoned in the telecine suite and said turn the <laughs> turn the colors up. Or you know, I, I remember the, the 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 person who's doing the grading really enjoy, enjoyed it because we just kind of you know play around with things and I yeah. Were you a one man crew the entire time? Um, no, Jerry came out with me a lot. Actually, after uh, the uh, first one or two shoots, I think we had some edit time booked to try and see what we could do with this material and i think jerry said well, well the, the the pictures are cool you've got some cool stuff here but the sound is really terrible you really need someone to come along and help you get decent sound so he took a sound recording course at the national film school and started coming out so it was, it was after after the first two shoot it was basically me and jerry um a few of them, a few of the little ones I did on my own after, uh, but mostly it was me and him. Were you going, were you staying with them on tour a consistent time or just going out in these little pods of like three days at a time? Yeah, little, little pods. I think the longest one was Japan, which was maybe a week, 10 days, something like that. But yeah, but usually a few days. The biggest, okay, the biggest editorial question I have that was probably, I, I wish I could say it was influential, but I've never been able to use it adequately as magically as you guys did, is um, the overlapping of images, the dissolve technique, how you're constantly playing uh, images half dissolve over each other and moving to it. Because, like, one of my definitive edited sequences of all time is the opening of Apocalypse Now, and even in what you guys are saying in this, like, grab, hash grab kind of way, you guys are 
it, it felt like that only in a different era. But I mean, it's it's so it's so lyrical and eloquent, like you said. The lyric lyricism it seems like the priority of that comes through. Yeah, um, I mean, I, it's hard for me to about overlays because it, it's a terrible habit I have, and I've been doing it since my first music video until the thing that I'm doing now. And I keep trying not to do overlays, and, but I can't It's a it. trick in your grab bag to use. More than a trick in the grab bag, it seems to be my one trick pony. Well, what, what are the priorities when you're doing it? Are you looking um, uh, compositionally or graphically one side of the frame versus another side of the frame? Just what mixes together? Is it just a pure instinctual i mean do you, do you especially in um digital editing do you slide one image over the other and see just how cool it looks and then try what works no it tends to be i mean it's, it's mostly instinctual but there's been some learning but it's still instinctual but i'm, I'm quicker at, at identifying what works with the instinctual action um and usually it's a case of taking two elements that feel like conceptually and in terms of the, the uh, chiaroscuro is not the right word, something about the, the, the way that blend layers mm. operate, you know, how much dark, how much light, how, how successfully and pleasingly are these going to blend together? And then I'll run off a long, long, long stretch of, them and then see what within that longer layer is salvageable. There does seem to be color to black and white to color to black and white, but I don't know that would, that would, I mean, does that go into the lay or the, what you're talking about? Do you mean uh, as a structural thing, colors are black and white? Or just a, I'm, I, every time I see that, I, it's, I mean, I, I know you say it's a trick you use, but it's something I've I, I tried so many times and I never can get it. It's like, so I always wanted to know what the methodology to divide to just dive into it and do it right. Like, and it, I mean, if it's instinctual, it's instinctual, and I'll I will go to my grave never figuring it out. But stuff with dark backgrounds is a good place to busy, bright, okay. simpler things. Bright foreground, okay. dark background, and you start start doing that. Okay. Um, so, um, what? One of the other things that bugs me about the perception of this movie is it seems like everyone makes a big deal about this movie being uh, the band being miserable, mm. and it seems to have this tone, especially a lot of the reviews of them being miserable because they think they're smarter or better than their audience. They have like a don't look back five from Dylan they're, they're reading under. And that's not how I, I treat the movie. Like, it, like they clearly enjoy the music. Or, I don't know. Was that your, I mean, did they, what was your sense of the band? Like over the course of the year on tour with them? Um, I think just, I mean, it's a year. Whatever's so in the film. I mean, I, I, I can't really separate what material there is in the film because, because basically I shot 90% of the time I was with them. So there wasn't much outside the film that was, okay, this is what they're really like. And of course they would have had joyful comedy times on tour. But while I was there, that's what I filmed. And so that's what the film got made out of. Um, so, What's your perception of what you filmed, though? Um, like you, I, I don't quite get the way that people can say, oh, this is about the band being miserable while they're listening to the music in a very specific emotional way. Because to me, the idea was to try to make a film that operated like the music, so the emotions that people have as real people in the film okay. are analogous to the feelings expressed by the fictional razor in the songs. Or, okay. you know, somehow those, you know, alienation, fatigue. Yeah. 
it felt i mean i i think that's when people missing the point like it just it feels like the album and it feels like yeah. an extension of the album and that's and why I mean, the album is not... true and good because it's about real feelings I noticed last night, like, well, I've whenever I've watched the movie in the past, I'm like, it's hard to to line up incident because the movie is so lyrical and flows. It just flows the entire time. But last night, when I first watched it, I was, um, you know, a teenager going to college, obsessed with the band, had obsessed over OK Computer, and was uh, with a ton of other people just waiting on the new music. So I would obsess over the album to find out what new songs were going to be in there, things like that. And when I was watching it last night, I was really astounded that one, Tom York at the end lays out a pretty concise, his problem with, thematically lays out the movie where his problem is not so much he doesn't enjoy playing and talking to journalists, it's that he hates this, they make something creative and then there's this giant machine to sell it and it, this it was grinding to to do that and then you structure it where they they go into the studio there's they they show this them trying to get a man of war in the studio which is some amazing footage especially for a band that's so studio based and then you come back with where at the end of their last show that you show they're like we don't know what the future is and like we don't know where we're going from here and it feels like the stopgap between okay computer and kid a yeah exactly you got it. <laughs> okay. I mean, was there what kind of wor structural work were you were you figuring with the um, when you were putting the thing together? Was it mainly chrono chronological? Because you do yeah, switch. Yeah. You go you go to Japan for a bit, which is January ninety eight, okay. and then you go back to the studio, which was uh, December ninety seven. So you make a point of like that moving wrong? that later into the film. What, what was? Can you can you uh, illuminate the, me there, that? there's um before you go to the studio yeah. which is date again because the, there's the dates on the, in the movie it's in uh it's in december 97 and before that you had already gone into japan with them and showed some scene footage of them in japan which was in january 98 okay so you you go against the chronology okay. just to get the studio and where you got it in I, my my general question was what was your what was your uh, idea for the overall structure of the film or it, how did you get through it? The, the, the overall idea for the structure was was as ever born out of being um, ignorant and not knowing what else to do. So you know, mm -hmm. there's this beginning, middle, and end which just exists. And I didn't think, I mean, as it happens, the beginning, middle and end had its own perfect narrative. You know, we didn't know how that that end was going to be an important end for a certain type of music making for them and was going to start them on a path of rejecting a lot of the things which we'd heard them getting pissed off about in the previous hour and a half. But but really it was just pure chronology. So that's why I'm a bit that's why I'm a bit taken aback by saying you saying oh you went back in time, but it makes perfect sense because it flows. Oh, it, do it totally flows. In fact, last night was the first time I ever noticed it. Okay, like it, it the the flow is there, and, and, and especially for the thesis that they're they're trying to figure out what's next at the end of this after they've gone through this process of being selling the album. Um, so you mentioned you you uh, booked the uh, time with an edit suite. What was the editorial process like on this? Like, how long did you guys cut? I can't honestly remember now. Um, the most important thing for me was watching all all the footage, and this was pre computers, really. So I had two hundred hours of rushes. The only way I could really watch those is to have 200 hours of VHS tapes made out of our rushes. And I sat oh, God. in my flat for a month and just did, you know, nine to five, nine to six of just sitting there with the VHS machine watching this crap 
hour after hour and, and trying to deal with them the unhappiness of how much crap I'd shot for so long. Um, but once I got past that and had found the 10 hours that weren't crap, um, then we started having fun with it. And we did our first, I think our first edit was 10 hours and we watched that through and thought, this is pretty good. Do you still have that 10 hour cut? No. Okay. What was the process of um, uh, getting the um, approval for the band with the cut? Did you have to show them cuts? Did the management say like we don't want this in and we like music wise or songs or content? Um. There's that really great clip at the end that hit me last night where uh, Johnny Greenwood's talking about watching a Pink Floyd documentary that or wanting to or reading about a Pink Floyd documentary that they had to um, Pink Floyd rejected because it showed pink floyd going to business meetings yeah i found that very telling yeah that was i remember that story being around and um again this is a long time ago and i've had a lot of time to forget stuff but it mm. basically dilly the commissioner at parlophone was very cool and like in combination with the band the vibe was once you're on it and you're doing it you get respect it's your work, they're artists, you're something like an artist, well, so you just get on with it. Um, and I guess somewhere along the line, people were liking what we were doing, you know, little bits were leaking out. I'd, I'd done the No Surprises video by that point, which made people kind of think, okay, might be onto something else here. Um, and I, the band came and sat in our edit suite and watched stuff a couple of times until they got really bored. I don't, I, I remember a couple of things of people going, not sure about that, but can't, but no notes, no take this out, none of that stuff. And I really can't remember anything other than just editing it and say, well, it's done now. And, well, what's funny is for even big Radiohead um, uh, fanatics right now, like there's still all these clips online for years on YouTube of just the smidges of the old versions of songs. Like, yeah, um, I, yeah like you'd have the old version of Follow Me Around, um, the old version of Life in a Glass House. Uh, I got, um, I've always heard an uh, early version of Knives Out and there's an electric piano. There's a, uh, Last night I heard I Will for the first time. The movie ends on nude. And then you know, you got Man of War in the studio that they're working on that they reject. So, like, and you just sort of like, what's cool and what, what flows? Yeah, I mean, um, you've got to understand how, it, how terribly exciting it was thinking that you're making a film about a band playing the best album in the world. And then you go out and shoot it. And then they start doing a new song. And you're stood there with a camera while they're doing this, and it's just so every, every new thing that I heard, I just glommed onto, and then so I didn't know what they were, and, and they didn't, you know, half the time they didn't have titles, and nobody spoke about them. But it was just a case of like, this is fucking new. This is the next thing. This would you like film the? Uh, um, um... What's the pre-show thing? The guitar um, sound check. Um, sound check. Yeah, sound check. you would. You yeah, that's that was the form was as far as I remember and the memory and all that. Um, they would try out one or what usually one new thing in a sound check. So I got to, after a while I got to new know that you know get get prepped for mm. an unfamiliar first chord. Oh yeah, I I followed Radiohead for a few shows in 2000, and we I remember they had all these outdoor arenas, and you'd get to hear sound check occasionally. And I remember if we got there early enough, it was funny because it was in the middle of summer, so it would be like unbearably hot in the sun. But we'd like we think we hear a new song at the sound check. And were you so were you a big fan going? Because I mean, you mentioned meeting the band for the first time when you were getting the job. Were you a a a big fan, a normal size fan, or were you just happy that you were working with a band that people were excited about? Um, I think a big fan. 
I remember, I remember I was still into the, 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 I was still of an age and into, you know, come the end of the year, going, who was the greatest album of last year? And I remember the year mm. that Ben's came out, being very surprised at listening to it at the end of the year and going, well, it was that, by that band was the best album, best rock album. And then when, so, and that, that grew and, and and I really loved that record. And then when I got given the cassette of OK Computer and started playing that, it was just, oh, this is off the scale. I, don't, I can't even remember what other bands were, you know, doing stuff that year because this was just no question. Yeah, and there's, it, it's, also, it's always nice going back to the, um, the beginning of the doc when you guys overlap all the um music press and it reminds me of uh what i mean i was too young to pay attention to what was cool coming out that year but retroactively you know 23 years ago what was cool coming out it's like oh cool sleater kinney or corner shop or something like that um so um you mentioned the no surprises a video and that no surprises sequence when you guys are filming the video is one of the one of the more mm. I think it's kind of one of the more notable sequences in the movie. Um, and it's funny because you, you intercut the the um, morning show, the really vapid morning show people complaining about it's music to cut your wrist too. And, yeah. um, there, but there's, I remember over the years as I've watched that sequence, you, you have these shots of like houses and it always to me felt like this alternate video to no surprises for big chunks of it. Like, it, I don't know, I think it's in the Japan sequence or you started from Japan. Um, come on, sorry. Or you were you just trying to get the song in to like make sure that you were showing which the footage you got of the uh, shooting behind the scenes in the video? No, I can't, I can't remember. I'm sorry, I can't remember what, how the, how the flow so se sequences go, but the the houses and all that were uh, a lot of this stuff was derived from looking at Tom and Stanley Donwood's artwork and thinking about where that artwork was in the real world. And mm, at the okay. time, there was a lot of development going on in, in specific areas east of London, London that being kind of badlands or were being colonized by shopping malls and new housing estates. And so a, me and a friend went driving around for a day or so to these new developments in in what were previously badlands. And that's where all that st stuff came from. Okay. So I was mistaken. It wasn't, it wasn't Japan or anything like that. Um, so uh... yeah, it might've been the same telecinish session where we graded the Japan footage and London footage, so it might look oh. same, same kind of blues. I was actually at South by Southwest when the Joy Division documentary played, and uh, I've noticed this. What, what, what uh, the work I've seen of yours, cityscapes seems to be a big thing. Even I, I know you're trying to find the voice of the band and you're trying to represent the album, but yeah. you, there's this great sense of alienation in what you shoot in cities, and especially if you're shooting a movie like this where you're following a band on tour, it's a travel log of big urban centers, so it's it becomes an onslaught too. Yeah, I mean, do you shoot a lot of cityscapes? Is that a big deal for you too? Uh, not as a hobby anymore. I, I did as um, I've always been interested in urban stuff. I was a urban kid in a small town, small city, but very urban. And my academic, you know, at college, I studied cities. Okay. Is this a was this the trick in the grab bag that you had to to get rid of? Um, yeah, probably should. Mm. But 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 I'm still. Uh, no, in fact, the last time I did anything serious, kind of cityish, I did a film in 2015 about Istanbul, Istanbul, and shot the shit out of Istanbul for a month. 
Okay. Just accumulated a lot of footage in the same process. Um, no, this this was a very specific way of filming the city. Uh, the very you know, basically a, uh, a steady cam at night and into certain streets, and we just walked and walked and walked and walked and walked, and walked through the city, and and then it, I mean it's a it's it's a film. Okay. Um, do you have or um, do you have any relationship with the band anymore? Are you? Uh, had you guys filmed anything after after this? Um, what did I do? I tried to do a bit of work on Kid A, which didn't do didn't go very well because I didn't sync with where their head, heads was at. Oh. I was a bit of the uh, the old world, I think. But there's a there's a video a for Idiotech, which I sort of did half of. I filmed a fabulous live four song thing in a studio, which never never got released because it was kind of trad. You know, there was a tracking shot and the band were just, but they were looking like a rock band. And it's amazing. Uh, it's really amazing. It's really amazing. It was too slick for what they were doing. It was not so much slick, but just wrong. For what they were trying to do to identify about um, and i don't did you see the kid a tour at all yeah yeah well Very, no no actually i probably uh uh it might have been uh amnesiac tours when i first okay. saw them um if it's yeah anyway whatever i did was was not what they were at um okay I did some promos work for Tom's Eraser album, and I did some little thing, which I forget the name. What the what the name of the format was? Some little Instagrammy three minute thing for a track called The Numbers. Of- oh yeah, yeah. Well, because uh, wasn't there a thing? Didn't uh, Paul Thomas Anderson end up yeah. directing? So he yeah, did the music did. video, and then a bunch of other directors did these little blip one minute, two minute things for a bunch of the other trucks. I mean, it's got quite good directors, um, but I don't know what they're called. They, they seem to have, they have their uh, pulse on such like great visual directors. I mean, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the thing they were releasing around Hail to the, I think it was Hail to the Thief, the uh, most gigantic lying mouth of all time. And they had that uh, YouTube show. Yeah. And they were, and they were doing some really bizarre overly digital but still felt analog and it felt artistic work on it um i mean do you do you uh, did you have any relationship with uh uh hammer and tongs or uh yeah yeah i've I've, I've made music videos out of their production company for a while and so we were friends okay okay um well do you i mean do you have any like do you feel ownership over the 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 movie? Like I looked it up on the website, and they're selling like a PAL VHS copy of it, and then they have it up at their um, the library online to stream. Um, I mean, did you were you aware of that? Do you do you have any contact with anybody about there's it's the bands? No, because um, it was. I mean, it's so standard for working with bands that you materially you just sign everything and you never get a beam off of anything the, the the band's management were really kind and gave me like a point of a point of a point of a point um so i got a little bit of cash off it but that aside i mean it's such a personal thing there was so little cinematic artifice between me and what you see on screen that if I see it, it's beyond ownership because I was 18 inches away from that thing on screen and there was nothing between me and it. I mean, the, 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 the thing that still gets me more than anything was a uh, shot where Tom is singing Creep. I think it's in New York or Philadelphia. And I'm basically underneath him. He's kind of leaning over the top. And I can remember my muscles hurting and being scrunched and Tom being fucking there 
and my ears hurt and these people shouting and just feeling how you know when he opens his lungs and his voice cracks and he was there doing that and i was recording it and it you, you know that is a i that i also noted watching that last night that is an amazing sequence because you cut from them playing at glastonbury yeah and you cut to that and the beginning of that sequence he looks like he's making fun of creep and he's just kind of his his body language is so loose yeah and he's kind of like flipping the microphone and he's like wanting to hit the audience sing their version of it and then as he starts singing he gets back into it yeah. and you feel him find the love of the song again and then you later in the movie you have an interview where he talks about the clip from glastonbury that was on the a side of that yeah. and saying how it was one of the most amazing moments in his life he said it's an inhuman feeling yeah and it's just this like it said that's those two those two shots together that sequence says so much about the band in this tour yeah i'll tell you what just a sort of random fact the the analysis of that moment that is there's a there's a wonderful analysis of that shot moment by a writer called patricia lockwood i don't know if okay you know, she's a novelist poet um, and, it, and you can you can see it in the London Review of book, Books. Okay. Um, search for Patricia Lockwood on the internet. I forget what the title of the article is. It's a long article about all kinds of 21st century culture. And then right in the middle of it, she starts talking about that moment from meeting people is easy. And it's really, really on the money of what's going on inside what, that moment. what's the what's the uh, i mean i i do want to read this right away but what was the uh synopsis or what was the main thing she said it's saying? not so much the main thing she just uh, she talks about the look on tom's face and his body language when he's doing the thing at the beginning of the song where you say he looks disinterested and she talks about the kind of desire which is pulling him back in to himself and then the acting out of himself and she equates that to a particular relationship with self and body of our mean age when we have these little digital fragments of ourselves all over the place the games and the, the politics of okay and, you know, that, that's tom tom Tom's kind of prophetic character at that time was for someone who felt some of those postmodern conflicts and expressed them in rock songs. This you're 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 saying this, and I'm not. I'm starting to think I might have actually read this. This does sound familiar. Um, I know you, uh, your time's winding down. Uh, I guess what are what are the um, first off? I want to ask one of the last one thing about the last scene in the movie mm -hmm. where Tom's like uh, camera chaps, turn off the the. Photo. Was yeah. he talking to you or was he talking to the other photographers? In the, no, in the that was movie? us. I, th I think it was. I think it's Colin's voice. To, I think he actually says, "Can you turn it off?" Or maybe it's Tom. Okay. But anyway, no, it was us. And it really, and I think that's like we knew that that was the last shoe, last thing, and it's like, don't, we're going to get paid, you know, we get wasted now, so turn the cameras off. The reason I asked earlier about your ownership of the movie is because, for me, this movie is up there with, like, Stop Making Sense or Don't Look Back as one of, it's, I don't know if it's just you got a great band making some of their best work and you were making some of your best work and the stars aligned or what, but... I have seen this movie so many times and watched it so many times. Um, uh, are you working on anything right now? Yeah, lots. Of, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm terminally freelance, so I'm working on about fifteen things. But one one feature length thing, which has been going on for a couple of years, and will be finished next summer. Okay. Cool. And if we're and festivals are happening again, we'll get to see it. Yeah. It's called the gold machine. And it's, uh, of the last, last two films I've made of it about writers and particular landscapes that are associated with these writers. 
and this this is the third in a trilogy um and it's in, about london and this area of peru can you say the writer's name oh, writer the writer's, yeah, ian sinclair sinclair oh nice he's he's a big uh, contemporary of alan moore's isn't he he, he right, was in yeah. your um he was in uh, um, the, other, the other okay yeah yeah so he's he's trying to stop writing about london after 50 years and followed in his one of his ancestors just footsteps to peru and so we went to peru last year and shot a bunch of stuff uh, that's that's exciting i'm looking forward yes. to it um yeah freelance uh solidarity with you on that too um Grant G, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. This was an absolute joy to talk to you. I, I This movie means a lot to me. It was great to talk to you. Uh, it's really nice to hear you say that. It's really good. Thanks, man. Thanks.